welcome to worship here at Ocean View United Methodist Church. It's great to see each and every one of you. Those who are joining us online, we welcome you as well. Thank you for joining us on this rainy day, but it's a good day that the Lord has made, and we rejoice and are glad in it. At this time, we invite Ernest Leatherman to come forward and share some announcements with us. Good morning. Good morning. Although there will, there will not be a Christmas Eve service this year due to the pandemic, a link to a virtual recorded Christmas Eve with Pastor Edie will be made available to the congregation on Christmas Eve morning. Please check your inbox or the church uh, website at ovumc.org for further information on it. The message will be about 15 minutes in length and will include a Christmas homily with special music by Greg Walker. And speaking of Greg, Greg's online Christmas program is now available on uh, BIMO, B-I-M-E-O. A link to this can be found on the weekly news or by contacting the church office. Uh, want to offer many thanks to everyone who contributed to Toys for Tots this year. Uh, we were able to fill the box five times over. So this was a fantastic, fantastic <laughs> Donations are still needed for winter night sheltering. And uh, it's that it is being sponsored by the Brunswick County Street Reach. Donations in any amount are appreciated, or you can sponsor an in individual entire family for one week at Captain Coe's Motel for $200. And thank you to everyone who has contributed to this uh, wonderful mission. Last but not least, uh, the church office will be given a vacation. Church office will be closed for the Christmas holidays this year from Christmas Eve Day through New Year's Day, reopening on January the 4th. We pray that all of you will have a happy and healthy Christmas and New Year. Pastor Ed. Thank you, Ernest. On this fourth Sunday of Advent, we are going to be lighting the fourth candle on the wreath and we have Char Hannigan and Skip Fox who will be doing that with us so if you would come forward and do that. Good morning. Good morning. Our verse today is Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. We light this candle as a symbol of the Prince of Peace. May the visitation of your Holy Spirit, O God, make us ready for the coming of Jesus, our eternal hope, our way, our infinite joy, and our everlasting peace. Amen. Thank you, Shara and Skip. Would you join me as we pray? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It is you that we assemble to worship this morning, to give you honor, thanks, and praise 
for your love and your mercy ever blesses us. Your spirit nourishes us, even as we hear the rain falls and is nourishing the earth. We pray, Lord, that your spirit enlighten us this morning. Help us to have an encounter with the Holy Christ. Be with those, Lord, who wanted to come out but could not for whatever reason. Be with all those, Lord, who need to feel your presence, to know that you are the Messiah and that you are in our midst. Let what we do this morning, God, please you and be acceptable in your sight. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We invite Ernest to come back for us. He will present our scripture message for us this morning. Scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses one in those days a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quinius was governor of Syria. All went, their own, all went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went into the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them at the end. In that region, there were shepherds, shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. When an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you great news, great joy for all the people. To you, to, the, to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you that you will find a child wrapped in a band of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that, is, that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child laying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told to them about the child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured these words and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
pray with me. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of these, your people's hearts, be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. In Christ's name we pray, amen. There is a story that dates back many, many years ago that is sometimes shared around this time of year. Its ancient truth is still very relevant for us today this fourth Sunday of Advent. It's about a monastery which had fallen on very hard times. At one time, its many buildings were filled with young men, and its huge church rang with the singing and the chanting of praises to God by these monks. But now it was empty. People used to come from the surrounding countryside to visit and receive spiritual nourishment and prayer. But they came no longer. All that remained of the monastery was a handful of old monks who shuffled through the cloisters. These old men still praised God, but they did so with heavy hearts. On the edge of the woods of the monastery, an old rabbi had built himself a simple little hut. He would go there from time to time just to fast and pray. No one ever spoke with the rabbi, but whenever he showed up, the word would be passed from monk to monk. They would say, the rabbi walks a monk. The rabbi walks in the woods. For as long as the rabbi was there, the monks would feel sustained in his prayerful presence. One day, the head monk of the monastery decided to visit the rabbi, to open his heart to him, and perhaps receive some counsel from him on what they might do for the monastery. So after the morning communion service, the abbot set out through the woods to the little hut. As he drew near, he saw the rabbi standing in the doorway. The rabbi had his arms outstretched in welcome. It was as if he had been waiting there for a while. The two men embraced each other like long-lost brothers. Then they stepped back and they just stood there grinning from ear to ear until they could hardly contain themselves. After a while, the rabbi motioned for the abbot to come inside his humble hut. In the middle of the room was a wooden table with an Old Testament open on the table. They sat there at the table for a moment in the presence of the scriptures. Then the rabbi began to cry. The monk, being unable to contain himself, covered his face with his hands and began to cry too. For the first time in his life, the monk cried his heart out. The two men sat there like lost children the hut filled with their sobs, and the wood of the table became wet with their tears. They cried until there were no more tears. Then the rabbi lifted his head and said, You and your brothers are serving God with a heavy heart. You have come to ask a teaching of me. I will give you a teaching, but you can only repeat it once. After that, no one must ever say it again. The rabbi looked straight into the abbot's eyes and said these words, the Messiah is among you. For a while they sat together in silence. 
Then the rabbi said, now you must go. The monk left without a word and without ever looking back. The next morning, the abbot called the monks together. He told them that he had received a teaching from the rabbi who walks in the woods. He said this teaching was never to be spoken aloud. Then he looked at each of his monks and said, the rabbi told me that one of us is the Messiah. The brothers were startled by this saying. What could it mean? They asked themselves. Is Brother John the Messiah? Or Father Robert? Or Brother William? Am I the Messiah? What does it mean? They were all deeply puzzled by the rabbi's teaching. But as they were instructed, no one ever mentioned it again. As time went by, a change began to take place. The monks began to treat one another with a very special reverence. There was a gentle, wholehearted human quality about them now, which was hard to describe, but easy to see. They lived with one another as people who had finally found something but they prayed the scriptures together as people who were always looking for something. The occasional visitors from the area found themselves deeply moved by the transformed life of these monks in their community. Before long, people were coming from far and wide to be spiritually nourished by the prayer life of these monks. Young men were asking once again to become part of this monastery community. In those days, the rabbi no longer walked in the woods. His hut had fallen into ruins. But somehow or other, the old monks who had taken his teaching to heart felt sustained by his prayerful presence. Of course, this old, old story relates to the message of a much older, more familiar story, the Christmas story. On this last Sunday of Advent, we come together looking to celebrate the good news of Christmas, that the Messiah is among us. In just five more days, we celebrate the birth of God's long-awaited promise of salvation for this lost and desperate world. The Messiah is among us. It is wonderful news. Yet because the story of the birth of Christ is older than Christmas itself, it may have become overly familiar to us. We may no longer feel the sense of awe and wonder we felt as a child about Christmas. EmailSanta.com receives more than one million emails every year, and every one of them gets a response. Some samples of the email may, they receive from children might jog our memories about how excited we once were about the season. Dear Santa, I'm sorry for putting all that x lax in your milk last year, but I wasn't sure if you were real. My dad was really mad. <laughs> Signed Bree, age seven. <laughs> Dear Santa, Mama and Daddy say I have not been very good these past few days. How bad can I be before I lose my Christmas presents? Signed Christian, age seven. 
Know any adult Christians making the same question? Dear Santa, thank you for the remote control car last year, even though it broke the next day. I know you tried, and that's what counts. Alex, age eight. I think my favorite is from Roxanne, age 11, who wrote, Dear Santa, do you know Jesus is the real reason for the season? Not to be mean, but he is. Young Roxanne is right. We may have outgrown the joy and the thrill of the birth of the Christ child, or discarded the story as if it were of no more significance than the belief in Santa Claus that some of us have laid aside. It's so easy to lose sight of the real meaning of Christmas in the midst of rushing from store to store, standing in socially distanced lines and scurrying to complete the online ordering or mailing in time for Christmas Day package or what. Reverend Gary Statman tells this true story that happened on Christmas Day in the church he was serving at the time. A friend of his was leading worship with the help of four children. They were to tell of the great hope that is ours because the star shone one day over a stable, announcing the birth of a Savior for all. At a given signal, each child was to flip over a large piece of cardboard, spelling for all to see the word star, S-T-A-R. Unfortunately, the friend did not realize when the cards were flipped over, the letters would be in reverse order. So the word for all to see was rats, R-A-T-S. As you might imagine, it took some time until the laughter died down in the congregation and the service could continue. <coughs> Yet in the humorous way God has in teaching us sometimes, there was a lesson within this lesson. Even though the Messiah is among us, Christmas is not necessarily an easy time of year. For some, rats is too mild an epithet for the disappointments of Christmas. For many people, there is a great deal of frustration, disappointment, and stress connected with this season. When it seems everybody else is happily celebrating the season, there are always those among us who are hurting and grieving. That is especially so as Christmas comes this year in the midst of a pandemic. It can seem for many people their hopes are built up at this time of year only to be dashed once again. Some people give in to the hopelessness. In fact, during this time of year, while so many whoop it up and live it up, more people end their lives than at any other time of the year. More people either break up or crack up or give up in the midst of all the merrymaking. With the news of so many of our troops still facing risking their lives in foreign lands, of bombs and weapons wielded by terrorists taking the lives of the innocent in our own and other nations, of the resurgence of ugly, violent racism that has whites and blacks and other people of color pitted against each other in fear and hatred, it is easy to have serious doubt of the relevance of the song of the angels, which they sang that first Christmas. Glory to God 
in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill for all people. Events in our world today make us want to cry our hearts out, much like the abbot and the rabbi. And when we praise God so often, like the monks, we do so with a heavy heart. But it is in these anxious, hostile, war-torn, and fearful times, like today, that we most need to hear the Christmas message loud and clear. The Messiah is among us. It's no coincidence that God's greatest gift came at a time of high anxiety. The whole world, which for all intents and purposes was the Roman Empire, was to be registered. Even the nation of Israel was under the oppressive rule of Rome. They had to participate in the Roman power move called the census. You know the story of the poor, weary, travel-worn couple on their way to be counted. Joseph and Mary could find no room in any inn to give birth to their child. So they settled in a cave with the farm animals. They laid their firstborn child wrapped in strips of cloth in an animal trough. God, as an infant, broke into human history. God, making God's loving presence known to us so intimately, so mysteriously. How could this little baby boy be the son of the Most High God here in an animal trough, a feed trough, surrounded by the smell of barnyard animals. Here is the Messiah among us. As the hymn of Philip Brooks, A Little Town of Bethlehem, simply and profoundly declares, Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light, the hope and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. The moment in which all of history had been moving towards had arrived. Isn't it true today? This battle between hopes and fears competing for our hearts and our minds, continues to be waged. Friends, even today, and every day, we still must seek to decide which way shall I lean, toward my hopes or toward my fears. At a young 67 years of age, the onset of early Alzheimer's combined with a fall which left him with broken bones, internal injuries, and pneumonia. A siege had been laid against Tom Robertson. Lying unresponsive on his bed in the intensive care unit, he had been hooked up to a respirator. I could still see Hints of the physical strength of this man, born in the Appalachian Mountains, once had. Ellen, his wife, had laid a picture on his pillow. It was of the two of them in happier times. Tom's sparkling blue eyes and the bright, warm smiles of the two shared was a reminder to all who stepped into that room. This is a man loved and is loved. As I gathered with them and the ten members of the family around his bed, holding tearful vigil, I marveled. 
As deep and poignant as their grief was, this family did not grieve as those without hope. The hope was articulated so eloquently by Ellen. The words and prayers of faith came forth from her so naturally and spontaneously it was clear. She had an intimate relationship with her Lord and Savior. This family knew the Messiah was there among us. Tom Robinson went home to be with the Messiah as we prayed the 23rd Psalm together. A beautiful poem composed by Ellen, his wife, was written a couple of years prior to this, her husband's home going. Not knowing why she wrote it then, she understood now, at that point, was the time for which it was written. Her poem is titled, Just For Today. Just for today, I choose to rejoice and lift up my hands, my heart, my voice, in spite of my blemishes, warts, and spots, in spite of overwhelming mays or may nots. Just for today, I choose to believe that my God is big enough to meet any need I might have whether for me, for my family, health, or my friends, for my church, my country, for this world steeped in sin. For all we have is right now, today. So on my knees of my heart, I choose to pray and give thanks to the one who made me whole who glued back the pieces of my broken soul. I choose to make this day a day of thanksgiving, a life full of praise, a life full of thanks living, and be grateful to the Lord who gives life from above, who chose to bless me with gifts and his love. Beloved, the Messiah is among us. The moment all of history has been moving towards has arrived. Do you believe it? Yes, this world is in a mess. Yes, many of our lives may be as well. Right now, we may be feeling that in the battle of hopes and fears, the fears are winning. Even with the vaccines being trucked among us, we may fear the coronavirus is winning. We may fear the terrorists are winning. We may fear racial hate and prejudice and injustice are winning. We may be feeling death and grief are winning. But we can afford to take out time to celebrate anyway. In fact, we must. Because the Messiah is among us. The Messiah is among us. Because he is among us, we can live as transformed people, even in the midst of chaos and pandemic. Because he is among us, the world's warring madness can be abated because he is among us. Righteousness and peace with justice can be in our homes and in our homeland. Because he is among us, love, not hate, can prevail. Beloved, which way are you leaning? Towards your hopes? towards your fears. In a very real sense, what the old abbot of the monastery said was right. Each of us is the Messiah.
to those around us. When we are thinking Christ's thoughts with our thoughts and our minds, doing Christ's work with our bodies, giving Christ's love in our hearts to others, letting Christ's peace reign in our lives. The Messiah is a Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today and every day. Be the Messiah among us. Amen.
Let's share that good news and that gospel with the world as we go forth. And may you go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And have a Merry Christmas.